Good evening. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Please take your seats. Welcome. Uh, my name is Liz Siegel. I'm chief curator here at the Milwaukee Art Museum. And tonight, we welcome you to an expert series conversation between artist Rebecca Belmore and curator Wanda Nannybush. And, but before we even get to the main event, we have um, two wonderful performers who I would like to introduce for you now. Jennifer Stevens, a soprano trained in classical and opera genres, as well as an expert on Oneida woodland style pottery. She is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and a descendant of the Oglala Lakota Nation of South Dakota. She recently performed as a soprano soloist and composer for the Goodman Theater in Chicago and premiered her music at Venice's International Festival of Contemporary Music. She will be accompanied by acclaimed pianist Jana Ernst, who has performed with the Skylight Music Theater, as well as the opera companies of New Orleans, Virginia, Cincinnati, and Florence. And please join me in welcoming Jennifer and Jana. Thank you.
very much. And I wanted to let you know that there is some, I call my water melodies, in the accompaniment. And um, oh. Janet was able to bring that out. I hope you enjoyed that. And the reason why I added the water melodies is because we are uh, along the Lake Michigan, the, with the uh, museum being by the Lake Michigan. And also, uh, a lot of the um, time I spent here in Milwaukee since I moved here in 2020, I was by the water, and I used the water as my inspiration um, for my music and my art. But also, I wanted to share with you, the Oneida people are from upstate New York, and we had to travel, and it was the waters, the Great Lakes that carried us safely here to Wisconsin. So again, it's in honor of my grandmother and my ancestors. Thank you so much. Thank you both so much. Uh, tonight's conversation takes place as part of the programs around Native America in Translation, an exhibition of 10 artists who use photography to tell new stories of indigenous cultures, histories, and representation. The exhibition is curated by artist Wendy Redstar, and core to its thesis is the essential role that language plays in constructing our worldview. Each artist is a citizen or descendant of a different native nation, and their works are rooted in those contexts. So here in Milwaukee, at the Milwaukee Art Museum, we are on the traditional homelands of the Ho-Chunk, the Menominee, and the Potawatomi people, on the shores of Lake Michigan, near the meeting place of the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnikinnik rivers, historically a gathering place. Citizens of the Ho-Chunk Nation, the Menominee Tri Indian Tribe of Wisconsin, and the Forest County Potawatomi continue to thrive here, along with citizens from the other nine Native nations located in Wisconsin, including the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, Lac Corte Oreille Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, Lac du Flambeau Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, Oneida Nation, Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, Scogin Chippewa Community Mole Lake Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, the St. Croix Chippewa Indians of Wisconsin, Stockbridge Munsee Community Band of Mohican Indians, and Brothertown Indian Nation. Citizens of these nations, as well as many other indigenous people of various affiliations and descendancies thrive here in our city and thank you for your continued stewardship and care for this place. Um, I don't know how to advance the slides from here, but we will take another, the next slide, please. So I also want to thank, I feel like I'm getting a sign from them on how to advance it. Oh, it's over there. See, thank you. Thank you. I know. <laughs> Ta-da. Actually, Juan, I'm going to give this back to you. It's going to be right here because you guys will need it next. Okay. okay. So thank you to our sponsors, too. Um, Native America in Translation is organized by Aperture and is made possible in part with generous support from the National Endowment of the Arts. Exhibitions in the Hertzfeld Center for Photography and Media Arts are sponsored by the Hertzfeld Foundation. The Milwaukee Art Museum also extends its sincere thanks to the 2023 visionaries. And a special thank you to the Milwaukee Art Museum Native, Advisory, Native Initiatives Advisory Group, who have worked very closely with the staff at the Milwaukee Art Museum to develop programming around this exhibition that will create a lasting impact on our institution. I would also like to thank our sponsors for making tonight's expert series possible, including Milwaukee Art Museum's Contemporary Arts Society, Milwaukee Art Museum's Photography Council, and the Midwest Art History Society. So indeed, tonight's event serves as the keynote presentation for the Midwest Art History Society. And so before I introduce the speakers, before I get to the main event, 
I would like to welcome Rebecca Brennan, Associate Dean and Professor of Art History at Oklahoma State University and President of the Midwest Art History Society. I promise also to be very brief because again, I know that I am not the primary reason that you are here tonight. Um, I'm so thrilled to be in Milwaukee and uh, the Midwest Art History Society, which actually reaches from coast to coast, is very proud of our investment in the middle of the country. <laughs> okay. Not that we exclude the coasts, but you know, things happen. Um, <laughs> In any event, the Midwest Art History Society is a scholarly organization. It's an art history organization dedicated to bringing museum professionals, academic art historians, independent art historians together in a shared love of the history of art, a shared um, you know, journey of inquiry and shared ideas. And our annual conference is a really important venue for that, where we really welcome new perspectives and open conversations. Um, I want to give a shout out to our, our institutions here in Milwaukee that have been so generous with their time and their energy and their people. Um, of course, the Milwaukee Art Museum, the Mar Marquette University, and the Haggerty Art Museum, and also the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. All have been incredibly generous, so thank you to all of them. Um, of course, I would be remiss in not mentioning Catherine Swinsky, who is a curator here, over there, right over there, <laughs> here at the Milwaukee Art Museum, who has been our on-site conference organizer. So thank you so much, Catherine. <laughs> yeah. um, I just, I also want to give a, a sort of shout out, I know that sounds very colloquial, no, too bad, um, to, to Dr. Jane Waldbaum, who has been nominated for this year's, Char this year's Charles Cutler Award for contributions to the history of art. Um, typically, we, we announce this award at our business meeting tomorrow morning, which all of you are welcome to, 8 a.m., please come. <laughs> Drury, the Drury um, Hotel, so see you there. Anyway, I just wanted to give a shout out to her because I, I have on good, good information that she's here with us tonight. She was a long, oh, right there. Yay. <laughs> um, um, Dr. Waldbaum was a longtime faculty member at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, touched the lives of countless students and enriched enrich them, of course. And she is also um, the former president of the American Archaeological Society. So a very distinguished person among us this evening. So again, we're very grateful for all of her, her work um, with students over, over the years. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, and in the context of this evening, I think it's especially important to mention is that the Midwest Art History Society has a newly launched online journal called Venue. It is entirely open access for the public and our next issue um, is really in honor of the Eideljorg Museum's 35th anniversary and so there'll be essays not only on the Eideljorg's collection but on indigenous art in general, um, Native, Native American art, but specifically on the reinstallation of indigenous collections in Midwestern art museums. So I invite all of you to take advantage of to that, that really rich online um, resource. It hasn't been published yet, but it will be soon. Um, the first, the first uh, edition is already out there. But anyway, please join me in um, thanking everyone who has made this wonderful evening possible, and I just can't wait to, to, um, to hear and to learn from our speakers tonight. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> I promise. 
<laughs> that uh, this is the last time I get up here. Okay. Um, so finally, I am so excited to welcome and introduce tonight's speakers. Um, I know you all want to hear directly from them. So I'm going to make their introductions short, but please know that each of them has a CV the length of my arm and that you can find out more information about their illustrious careers on our website. Rebecca Belmore, a member of the Lok Sul First Nation, Anishinaabe, is an internationally recognized multidisciplinary artist currently residing in Toronto. Rooted in the social and political realities of indigenous communities, Belmore's work makes evocative connections among bodies, land, and language. She has been exhibiting her work at an increasingly rapid pace on a global scale with exhibitions and performances at the Art Gallery of Ontario, the Whitney Biennial, Documenta, and the Venice Biennale, among many others. Wanda Nanabush is curator of indigenous art at the Art Gallery of Ontario and the curator of Rebecca Balmore's 2018 mid-career uh, retrospective there. Since joining the AGO in 2016, she has organized numerous exhibitions of First Nations artists at a pace of about one a year, while also reconfiguring and reinstalling the J.S. McLean Center for Indigenous and Canadian Art there. Through her teaching, publishing, exhibitions, and collection diversification, she has become a leading voice for Indigenous and Canadian art. So I'm so pleased that you both have come to Milwaukee for tonight's conversation. We are excited to learn directly from you both. Uh, and please, everybody, join me in welcoming Rebecca and Wanda. Hello. <laughs> Anine, um, I thought we'd do the indigenous protocol of introducing ourselves in our own way. Um, Wanda Nanabush, an indigenous cause, Chinasing, uh, Donjaba, Mayangan, Dodem, um, where I come from is this little island, Chinasing, used to be called Christian Island. <laughs> Love when they rename our places. Um, and it's, uh, we call it the Caribbean of the North. It's very beautiful. Uh, I come from the Nanabush families, McHugh families, and Maneg families. Both my mother and my father come from the same reserve. And uh, thankfully, I have 17 brothers and sisters, and about 150 nieces and nephews, and great nieces and nephews, and great, great nieces and nephews. But I'm not that frickin' old, okay? <laughs> <laughs> And I'm very happy to be here. Thanks. <laughs> Your turn. All right. I'm Rebecca Belmore, and I'm um, a good friend of Wanda's. Woo, woo. Uh, I'm not her sister, <laughs> blood sister, but I'm her soul sister. And uh, I come from a family uh, not quite as large. Um, and I. But I, how large uh, is it? I, I live not in Toronto, but I. I kind of live between Toronto and Vancouver currently. And I was born in a small little uh, town on the Trans-Canada Highway called Uppsala, Ontario, which was maybe about 250 people, mostly Caucasian. And my family is from the Laxal First Nation, my mother's family, and my father was uh, what we would call like a, a town indigenous man, or back then we would have called him a town Indian. Uh, from the town of Sulacote, Ontario. Um, yeah, so I do today have uh, two wonderful sisters and three wonderful brothers. All right, take it away. <laughs> okay, let's All right, jump so into it. We'll just, we're gonna, we have 30 minutes with you, and then we're gonna let you ask questions, but please ask really good questions. Just kidding, you can ask anything. Um, and we, because Rebecca's work and the work that you see in the gallery is really grounded in her performance art practice, we thought that that's where we would start with a, a, a work called Creation or Death, We Will Win from 1991 at the Havana Biennial. Don't forget to turn out the lights. Thanks, man. Yeah. 
So as you saw, that's an excerpt of a longer, a longer work, but we gave you the beginning and the end. Um, I know that sight is extremely important for your practice, and I was wondering if you could talk about this site that you're working at there. Uh, yes, uh, so this is in the, the downtown, like right on the, right close to the Malacon in the city of Havana, and it's a, uh, it's a uh, historic uh, colonial fort, which is, I believe it's called the, um, Castillo de la Real Forza, which kind of I took to translate as and uh, translate into English as like the the castle of real force or the castle of strength. And so in 1991, I was invited to the uh, Venice Biennale, and it was my first time as an uh, indigenous person from North America, from Turtle Island, to go off uh, off our big turtle and onto the little island. And so for me, it was quite, uh, I was 31 years old, so I was half my age. So that beautiful black hair has gone, <laughs> has gone away. Um, but uh, what I recall is that year, the Biennale that was curated, the Havana Biennale, the thematic was uh, artists from third world countries, and it was kind of ironic that they invited indigenous artists from Canada, which is a first world country, to participate in this Biennale. And so I was working in this beautiful castle that was, had a central staircase, and because uh, Russia, or the USSR, had pulled out the rug from underneath Cuban people at the time, they were living in uh, extreme poverty, as they are today, and uh, for me, it was really an eye-opener to, to be somewhere where they had very little in terms of material wealth. So I used a red rope, uh, buckets of sand on each landing of the staircase and drew a, sign of land, a line of sand up towards the sky. Uh, I was bound and gagged, and then I set myself free. Next uh, slide. No, I'm just kidding. No. And rush through mic this. drop. <laughs> and I was like bound and gagged, and it's like mic drop. <laughs> uh, 
Um, this is a work, Fringe, which you created in 2007 in Montreal. And this is the, the, um, the uh, photograph, which is a light box as well. Um, but I wanted to show also it in situ, which just means where it was sitting. Um, first and then come back to the... So if you want to talk about where this came yeah. from. Uh, at the time that I made this uh, image, which was, as you said, in 2007, um, I was living in the city of Vancouver. Uh, and uh, on a very particular day, like on a Sunday, sunny afternoon, you know, early winter, I think it was rainy probably and miserable out in Vancouver, I had to go home and get something that I had forgotten. And uh, so I went home from the studio and I was kind of like running through the, my, our apartment. And I had left the radio on because there were break-ins in our neighborhood. So I left like talk radio on, which was CBC radio because they talk a lot. And <laughs> as I was going through my living room, I kind of stopped in my tracks because I heard this woman speaking. And I recognized that she was speaking with an accent that I was very familiar with, which was, it was either, I thought, uh, Anishinaabe or a Cree accent. So she was speaking English and telling the story of how she had gone to the hospital at one point uh, and she needed surgery. And when she was in the hospital, she took her beadwork with her to pass the time as she was waiting for her operation. And so uh, to her dismay, when she was coming out of the anesthetic and back in her bed, she couldn't figure out why people like nurses, staff, individuals that she didn't know were coming and looking at her incision and being kind of amused. And so when she was finally alert enough, she realized that the surgeon had stitched some beads, her own, very own beads, into her wound without her permission. And this happened in 1980 in the tent, what's called St. Boniface, which is part of uh, the city of Winnipeg. Yeah, it's um, an ongoing, and I'm sure it exists here too, because there isn't a lot of differences across the border in this way, but um, most recently there was a video circulating of an Indigenous woman in a Montreal hospital, or a Quebec hospital, um, who was being uh, taunted and made fun of, and racial slurs were being thrown at her very recently um, while she was ill and dying. And so um, somebody actually took a video of it, and um, there's a huge kind of movement to sort of get to deal with the racism within the healthcare system. Um, and I know this project you were working with uh, was it uh, the Cree Health Board? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I came to making this image uh, just thinking about my own family. Uh, my mother was a bead worker. My grandmother was a bead worker, so I was thinking, well, this could have happened to anyone in my family. So that was my point that really, you know, it really hit me as I was <laughs> thinking about it for a number of years before I came up with this image. And so for me, this woman that's on this, uh, you know, uh, reclining on this uh, table on this white cloth, I see it as a, an image of healing where she will get up and she will move forward and walk forward but she will carry this scar on her back, which she will not see, but she will know that it's there. So now we are in Athens. <laughs> I know. You're gonna travel the world today, <laughs> puppies. That's right. Um, so now we're in Athens, and it's uh, 2017, and you are, uh, asked to make a work, and you find a site, of course, a site that nobody wants her to make work on, yeah. <laughs> and, and it begins. Yes, yeah, so in 2017, I, I was part of Documento 14, and I, um, I was lucky enough to go and have some pre-site visits uh, to the city of Athens, and the city is so overwhelmingly, you know, full of history and so full of, you know, energy and all this kind of craziness and chaos. And so I was like there trying to figure out what the hell am I going to do here? Um, so I managed to, um, to come up with this idea where um, um, 
I wanted to make a tent out of marble. And so while I was there visiting, a group of us artists went to uh, Piraeus Pier, which is where there was a, a large encampment of uh, refugees uh, at that time, and we took sleeping bags and some tents, and we went to their camp, uh, which was on this wharf, and right beside them were these huge big ocean liners with, you know, people who are on vacation and whatnot, traveling the world freely. Uh, so I, I was really struck by, you know, the contrast between these two realities that were, like, right beside each other. And as a visitor, you know, with my, you know, my artist friends, we were only there maybe 20 minutes, half hour, and, you know, I just took that home with me when I came back to, when I went back to Canada and went home. And as a, you know, as an indigenous person, uh, um, camping and being outdoors and being on the land is very, was very much part of my growing up. So we spent summers with our grandparents, we fished a lot on lakes, so we spent lots of time in, in the tent. So the tent is something that I'm very familiar with from my childhood upbringing. But of course, the tent has come to mean something very different today in our cities, in, you know, you know in Canada, in the US, in, you see it everywhere around the world. The tent is for, you know, has become like a makeshift home for people who are dispossessed or who have had to flee their own countries or their own lands. Um, so I wanted to make this tent and I, was, I had the f good fortune to, I'm gonna go to the next slide, yeah. I had the good fortune to place this tent on, on a very, on a protected archeological site which is called Philippapa Hill, which is across from the Acropolis. And from this hill you can see the, the Parthenon. So there's my little tent. Uh, which is carved from marble. It was carved at a, at a foundry, and it was fine-tuned uh, by myself and um, uh, my uh, artist partner at the time. And uh, yeah, so it was set on this hill, and what you could do is you could uh, go inside the tent. So it's a three-person tent, so three adult people can s sit inside this tent. Uh, and, and from the inside, you have, of course, this amazing view of the uh, uh, Parthenon. And if it, you know, for me as an indigenous person coming from the middle of nowhere, <laughs> the swamp, you know, the swamp lands of northwestern Ontario, <laughs> with all our beautiful waters and rivers and mosquitoes, uh, I was really, uh, you know, I was pretty. Uh, over, you know, overwhelmed that, you know, I got this amazing site and I got to produce this amazing work with the help of, you know, these amazing technicians. Yeah, I remember sitting inside of it. It's super cool, you know, marble. Um, and then when you're looking out, you're just sitting, like, inside of the repercussions of the power that the Parthenon kind of represents. And it's impossible not to think about that relationship when you're sitting inside. Yeah, and the title of the piece is uh, in uh, Anishinaabe, um, and it's uh, Binjia Onji, Binjia Inch Onji, which translates to from inside. So the interesting thing for me is I got to visit the quarry where the marble was uh, harvested from, and that very same mountain range is where much of the uh, Parthenon buildings, uh, a lot of the stone came from the same mountain. So I think that was pretty profound for me as, as an experience, uh, you know, as an artist working in 2017. Yeah, and how you make marble look like fabric is unfathomable to me. The museums are full of it. <laughs> so I was just like, go look at the museum. They go sure are full of it, right? <laughs> go look at the museum. Go look at your tent. Go back to the museum. Go back to your tent. <laughs> um. That's how, basically how it worked. So there are um, these works, all my relations. In Three of them are in the exhibition, but we wanted to make sure you could see all uh, five of them. Uh, and then we will yeah. talk about 
each yeah. one. So the, I'll just go through the. I'll go through it briefly because we don't want to eat up too much time. This is so. A lot of these five images are kind of loosely based on performance works. Uh, I have a tendency as a performance artist to like revisit uh, very specific materials, very specific tools. Whether I like to use water, I like to use a pail, I like to use a hammer, I like to use a nail. Well, I think if, if I had a hammer, <laughs> I'd hammer in the morning, you know, that kind of thing. It's almost uh, turning into a poem so, or a song. So, if I had a hammer, so, I would nail. So anyways, anyways, back to the seriousness of the work. Um, this work here is titled Witness, and it's based on a performance piece that I did in the downtown east side of Vancouver. So Vancouver is a city... I spent a lot of time there, so it's very much a site that I'm very comfortable working in, and it's a site that I know very well. Uh, so in um, in 2002, Two. Uh, Robert Picton was a serial killer um, who is you know who's who did his work uh, you know taking women from the downtown east side of Vancouver and taking them out to his pig farm and and torturing and murdering them. Uh, so finally, in 2002, he was charged and brought to uh, you know. Brought to justice, I guess. I don't know. I don't, yeah. It's not the right word, but you know what we mean. Anyways, he was caught. That's a better word. And so I, I made a piece that, you, that same, at the same, a few months after he was arrested in the same neighborhood where I did a series of actions, and one of the actions was to don this red dress and hammer it to uh, the telephone poles outside and you know outside in public space in the neighborhood and free myself of the dress this of course person in these images is not myself it's a model who happens to be my sister florine belmore and the word i mean the title witness tells you a lot but uh, we recently did an interview for a book that's coming out in australia um probably a couple of days ago and um uh, one thing that struck me about what you were saying was that, and I believe the same thing, is that sites and places and lands, like they hold memories and they hold um, this kind of, maybe it's a, also emotional space. And so, you know, to, you were in a sense a witness to that too, to what yes. had happened there through, the, through your body and what you were performing. Yes, yeah, so it, one of, some of the, act the other actions that I, were included in this work was the cleansing of the space by bringing buckets of water and washing the the pee you know off the out of the space because it reeked and creating a you know cleansing a space to make the peace to witness to yell the names uh, the first names of the women who were on this missing and murdered women's missing missing women's list at the time that this was taking place so, I mean, in this series, there's uh, also um, this work uh, thinking about the Starlight Tours. So um, it started, the conversation really started in Saskatoon, where the police kind of pick up Native men and they drive them outside of town in the middle of winter, drop them off, and they will, f so they will freeze to death before they can get back into town. And this happened all the way across Canada, and I believe it probably happens in the States. Maybe it hasn't been talked about yet, but it's definitely a thing that happened in Canada all across. And um, you made a work for Neil Stonechild, who was somebody who had passed, who had been murdered. It's a murder, really. Um, and uh, this work comes from that, I was yeah. sort of born out of that work. Yes. Uh, in what year? I don't know. Anyways, a while <laughs> ago. <laughs> A while ago, uh, well, I was... this work is 2017. This, is a, this is a collaboration between artist Osvaldo Giro and myself, where, so it's based on a, a previous work, a sculptural work, where we carved, we etched out uh, Neil Stonechild's surname from a series of um, ice blocks, which are this size, that, that are in this picture. So we etched out his name, so his name is not really there. It's, it's negative space. And it's set up outside you know, in outside a museum or outside a gallery space or whatever. And uh, the idea is that the work slowly melts. And so it's kind of like a, like a memorial that's not a memorial, 
to this tragic um, death and to this acknowledging this practice of the Starlight Tours and the murder of this young teenage 17 year old boy. But um, when so, he, so here, this yeah. piece is titled Mother. Um, and so I was just thinking about um, his mother, of course, really fought for justice and, and, and tried to, and worked hard against the police to bring them, you know, to, to have them be charged and, and face, you know, their own whatever. What's the word one? Help me. I wasn't really to listening to you. To, brought to justice. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> just making a joke. Just making a joke. <laughs> Anyways. Yes. I think it's, um, they, they ended up doing a big inquiry and then yeah. they had a commission and then they had, you know, a series of things that the, the police were supposed to do. Um, but every time we have these kinds of commissions and inquiries, um, the actual actions don't follow. Yeah. So they're still dealing with this right now. Um, and as we know, the police have not been kind to indigenous people and black folks. Um, and I'm saying that in the kindest fucking way I possibly could. Yeah. So yeah, so this is titled Mother. Uh, this piece is uh, titled Madonna and it's based on a performance work that Wanda curated many years ago. Yeah, it was 2012. It's like a game show here. <laughs> what year? Guess the year. Where were we then? <laughs> <laughs> but it was a work called Facing the Monumental, and we took the, uh, your survey show title from it as well. But we were in um, Queen's Park, which is, as you hear in the name, Queen's Park. And there's so many statues, you know, to the queen, to generals, and the generals always have really big things between their legs, like horses. Um, anyway, it's really ridiculous, this sense of power and the, the kind of continuation of colonial power in these spaces. And so Rebecca um, was walking through, and we had a conversation about what what would we do as a monument in indigenous culture in our, we're both in Anishinaabe, so we can also talk from that point of view. Um, and we really felt like we wouldn't do a permanent monu monument that doesn't really fit. And so you went searching for the oldest yeah. tree, the oak tree that's seen colonialism pass it by. Yeah, it, it actually um, is called a red oak tree and it's indigenous to, to that, uh, that part of the, the planet. Um, to those grounds, and the tree had this crazy plaque, so it had its Latin name, and then it said Red Oak, and it said, it, back in 2012, it was approximately 150 years old. So at that time, Canada was celebrating a much younger... Uh, it was Canada Day. But it was, like, Canada was only 125 or whatever. How old is Canada? I don't even know. How old <laughs> I is don't Canada? even really I don't, care. I don't know. Um, anyways. anyways, Who cares? <laughs> the, tree, the tree is older than Canada is what I surmised. I, thought, oh, I did the math. And I said, yeah, this tree is older than Canada. So it's witnessed more than the people that are on those horses and, you know, more than the queen you know, what's it, and whoever is in this big park. And so I had this idea to wrap the tree, uh, with the help of some assistants, we wrapped the tree in craft paper, this brown craft paper, and I had a friend, uh, an, a friend, a very tall woman, uh, she was my assistant, uh, and eventually I wrapped her into the tree. So that became, she became the monument you know, with the tree. So instead of, you know, a man on the horse, she was the woman with the paper uh, wrapped to the tree. So I was thinking about the relationship between, you know, how resource, how trees, how we, we use all these amazing other living things to create our lives as human beings. So it's the paper tree human relationship that I was kind of signaling here. And it was Canada Day, and because I was really involved with the Idle No More movement as an organizer in Toronto, um, we were doing, I was doing certain kind of practices like not asking permission to do things, like going and getting permits and stuff, so I had to really get Rebecca's permission because 
that day there were police on both ends of the park. And in the morning, that's the park where they do the, the 12 gun salute. So they shoot off guns into the air in celebration of the country and whatever. Um, so at the very end of the performance, um, we had set up speakers, really loud speakers, and played the, the 12 gun salute. Um, and so when Rebecca's kind of bent down in a meditative state, um, or maybe an honoring state, you tell me what the hell you were doing, I can just tell you what I saw. Um, <laughs> to, the, to, the, to the earth, to our mother, um, that's what I, how I saw it. Uh, all of a sudden, these gunshots ring out through the trees, right? Because we had it really loud. And I must say, as an audience person, it was like my heart just tore open. You know, it was just like, and even James Luna, who never cries, was bawling his eyes out beside me, the late great. And um, yeah, just that. So I think it's interesting that you went to, it also brought in the, what we do to the earth, what we do to women, it's all connected. How we, how we the place we place women at in society is, is definitely related to how we treat the earth and vice versa. So, yeah. Fine then, you don't want me to talk no more, boy, this is wonderful work. So okay, so here we are. This is uh, titled Matriarch, and it's, um, yeah, it's uh, roses, like real live roses, and well, they're, they're cut, so they're in the process of dying. Uh, and then there's some, uh, it's a trim of beaver pelt around the edge. Um, I, I don't really have too much to say about this one, just that, uh, yeah, it's, I see, the, in, you know, entitling it matriarch, I see the figure, this is a, fi this is a woman that, you know, represents uh, uh, leadership, strong leadership, and uh, maybe great love for her people. Like a queen. Like a queen. Um, this is Keeper, and... Uh, we wanted to kind of give you a sense of, one, how a performance, the, the performance that's related to the photograph, and then also the material and how it, in her work it becomes sculpture. So we have um, this photograph from the series, but then also this was a performance done in 2016 at the Art Gallery of Ontario. We have this colonial kind of center to the building that's been built on many times, um, and this stone floor. And uh, Rebecca's premise was she wanted to put clay on stone. And that was actually quite difficult to make happen, but we did, um, and create this massive painting of clay all o over the whole entire space. And so that was part of a festival called Nuit Blanche, which takes place annually, and it runs from dusk till dawn. So I worked over a period of 12 hours and painted this huge rectangle by hand using my buckets of clay and a rag. So why did you settle on this moment for the photograph? Uh, so Keeper, what does it mean? So I, um, the studio that I ended up in, in Vancouver to make these photographs, that's the, exact, that's the actual floor of the studio, like this old linoleum. So I was like, oh my God, that's the same color as the clay that I used for the in the atrium of the Art Gallery of Ontario. And so I thought it was like, a, it was like a, you know, I, you know, if you look hard enough and you're open enough to looking, you can see things uh, quite easily. So it became obvious to me that this is the work that I should make. Uh, so, I, you know, I think the two images, myself washing the floor with clay you know, washing the stone with clay and this colonial structure. And then in the photograph, my sister washing this old, you know, beat up old floor uh, with the same kind of clay. I, th I think that the, the relationship between the two is quite remarkable and, you know, p possibly accidental. It's, a, it's like a happy accident, mm -hmm. like, like a gift. Yeah, and you were also thinking about, <laughs> I'll tell you what you were thinking. Yeah, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you love when curators and art historians do that? Um, so anyway, also thinking about the knowledge that indigenous women carry in terms of caring for the earth and this kind of thing. You think, you think that's still in there? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I do think that uh, we work very hard. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't have video of that, huh? You're welcome to turn the audio off so we can talk over top of it. And also, the audio really sucks. Can, um, we, can we start it over? For a well, it's pretty long. Okay. It'll go all okay. the way around. OK. So this is the work that I, this is a, like a recent work from last year. Um, it's titled Ishkade uh, in Anishinaab Emowin which translates into fire. So it's a ceramic uh, uh, life scale figure that's a figurative, kind of ghostly, you know, kind of empty shell of a figure. Uh, it was made using a sleeping bag, and the sleeping bag was um, made into mold and then cast in, in clay and fired as a... It came, um, it was made in three pieces, so it was quite a, it was quite a feat to actually get this work done, uh, as it was not easy, <laughs> it was not an easy process. Um, and then surrounding the figure are, um, up, there's, there's around roughly 10,000 bullet shell casings, which I purchased from Cabela's or the other store, both in Canada and in the US. And I purchased them during like COVID, just at the, you know, late 2020, like late 2021. And it was very hard for me. To, I think I was the person who purchased all of them in both countries. So I cleaned, I cleaned it out. I cleaned out the stock. And uh, so this surrounding kind of surround the, of bullet casings, empty bullet casings, it's kind of like I see it as a, as a barrier uh, where you w wouldn't be able to touch the figure. Uh, and there's no one there. There's no one inside the sleeping bag. So there's this empty shell, the empty sleeping bag. And yeah, it's a, it's a new piece for me. And I was just thinking about, of course, uh, gun violence uh, in you know, this country, in our own country of Canada as well. And, you know, I come from a family that uh, uh, hunted re regularly for food. You know, my grandparents lived off the land, so I grew up around uh, firearms and, and, and hunting uh, rifles and whatnot. So, you know, I have an understanding of safe safety, gun safety, et cetera, et cetera. But I know that we do, you know, I do think about well, we can't help but think about what's what's happening around us in terms of, uh, you know, the problems that come with these uh, objects of that are intended to kill something, like whether it's a moose <laughs> or, you know, which was how we used we used those uh, items historically. So we're going to end with a performance. Uh, the most recent one we, were, we uh, did in um, Venice, Biennale in 2022. And um, it's a video, and we're not going to say anything about it except that it's called the, this, oh my fucking god, The Sound of the Color Field. You know how many times I've said that title, and this is the first time I've ever gotten it wrong or forgot it. Um, the Sound of the color fields. Take it away, maestro. And maybe the lights.
So, yeah. how are you feeling? <laughs> okay. So that was like a whirlwind tour of uh, just a from small, small to number of works. 2022. <laughs> um, we have time for two questions. <laughs> See how I did that? <laughs> Your turn. Go ahead. When you are considering how you want to convert a performance piece to a photo or a video, am I allowed? No. <laughs> That's unusual for me. Um, what are some of the most important elements that you consider when converting a piece of yours from a performance medium to a video or a photographic medium? Uh, well, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> I think like it's really about trying to figure out how to carry the spirit of what took place to a new place that took place, you know somewhere specific to a more general and maybe, uh, you know, these photographs, they travel around, right? They travel, they go to different sites and whatnot, whereas the, the performances took place in a very particular site. And generally speaking, I don't repeat performances. So they're a one time usually, and they're usually closely tied to site or whatever the conditions are of the site. So for me, I, I try to figure out how to best translate it in terms of capturing its spirit. One more. Yeah. I'm uh, just going to repeat it for the yeah. camera. So what current themes, uh, or what current, no, I won't even be able to, what current body of work pull, <laughs> pulls to you the most, and what kind of themes do you see overarching in your work? Well, I think that uh, I've come to see myself as uh, somewhat of a witness, so I think you know, as I have gone through, you know, 32 years of practicing, uh, of course, I have shifted and learned and aged and hopefully uh, gotten better at what I do. So it's, you know, that's why we call it an art practice. I've been practicing for 32 years. And I think that, uh, you know, people often ask me, well, how has much changed since when you were young? And I think things have shifted elsewhere, and then the ground is constantly shifting. But at the same time, a lot of the issues that we face as Indigenous people and as Indigenous women, I think, you know, we're still struggling. And I see it in my community, you know, my communities, uh, as I move around. Um, so I think uh, I will just keep on doing the same thing and just keep on getting better at it as I age more. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> and, I'll be here uh, for yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're lucky you're younger. You're going to have to carry me on your back. <laughs> so I think, you know, it's, it's just to keep on uh, practicing and, and looking at things that are difficult to look at, but at the same time trying to find something there that is, you know, making things beautiful, making things, you know, aesthetically pleasing for my own enjoyment as maker, and, and using that as a way to draw people in. So, you know, everyone can relate to a bucket of water, so that's why everyone knows what water is, you know, so those are very simple, basic ways of communicating without 
uh, a spoken language. It's like a physical body thing. So I think that's where, that's why I think I gravitate and hang on to performance. Maybe I, do, I don't do as much as I used to, but it's not something that I'm going to give up anytime soon. Well, I want to say, Rebecca, thank you so much for empowering us through the darkness. You bring us both at once. It's a beautiful thing. And thank, thank you. you all for listening. Thank you.